Fight the good fight of faith. We're in part, if I have this, the slide up here, and we also, if you could bring the side TVs up, Sky. Thank you so much. We're a little shorthanded. They're doing a great job back there. We're in part 16 of Battle Mind. How many knows that God has given you a mind that is also a mind equipped for battle? Shout battle. battle. You've been in a war from the very moment that you came into this earth and you never signed up for it, but it came to you. You can ignore that battle or you can get in the fight. Say, I'm getting in the fight. The Lord gave me that word this morning, which was get your house in order. And I want to permeate that through this message. It's time to get our house in order. We don't know the day or the hour of either our personal rapture, Jen. She's like, I've never heard that before. That's the day the Lord takes you home. We don't know the day or the hour of your personal rapture, so you should always be in a posture of getting your house in order, but that there's a shaking on the earth. How many knows there's a shaking right now? We're not in Kansas anymore. I grew up in the good old days. Take me back to the good old days. Something, I don't know how that song goes, but it came to my memory. Is that what it is? Anya's like, quit doing that, Hunter. Thank you, Anya. You keep them in line. The good old days. I grew up in the good old days where we had to be home before the lights came on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But we're in a different world right now. Satan is making his advancements to wage war against heaven. And right now, he's waging war against the body of Christ. Whether you know it or not, he's at war with you every second of the day. Say fight. fight. The good fight of faith. This is your call and your high calling is that there, you're in a faith walk. How many knows you have to live by faith and by faith alone? It's time to get our house in order. It's time to understand that God is doing something in the land right now and darkness will, listen to me, darkness will not prevail. Darkness will not prevail. Our nation is in a fight. And we as a church must get in the fight and fight the good fight of faith. I gotta make this laptop a little bit bigger for my eyes, amen? The faith and the fight has always been a fight of faith. When you're fighting, it is a fight of faith every single day. In your personal struggles, and your personal battles, to get here this morning was a fight of faith. Anybody? Just to get here was a faith walk. There was something, an unction, the power of the Spirit that drew you here, that something in you knew you needed to be here. But the ecclesia, that's the called out ones, that's the body of Christ, that's the remnant. Say, I am the church. The remnant right now is no stranger to fighting. You know, this nation is no stranger to big fights, to big battles. This nation was birthed in adversity. And your life is being birthed. And your life is being grown by your adversity. I can look at some people right now in the room, and I won't call them out by name, that are going through some of the biggest battles of your life. And your life is a living testimony of faith. The only reason you're able to make it is because of your faith. Amen? But the church is no stranger to adversity. The United States of America is unlike any other nation. The world has ever seen. Wait a second. Are you mixing politics? Listen to me. God loved the world. America is part of the world. America is part of the world that God wants to save right now. This republic that was birthed on liberty and justice for all, a nation that was founded not by men, listen, but founded by God himself. You know this country was founded by God? A nation far from perfect, founders far from perfect, but a nation that was founded upon God, stood upon God, a nation that believed in liberty and justice for all, a nation that was founded by God himself. This nation is in a war, and it is up to the children of God to change the trajectory of this fight. A 
at any given time, you can shout, you can say amen, you can say uh-huh, my, 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 my. Well, you can do whatever you want, but I just need some agreement this morning that we're in a fight. If you're watching a, ba a, a boxing match, you're going to be shouting, right now we are fighting against the enemy, but we have the upper hand. Thank you. A nation that understood that her success was dependent upon her relationship with the God of the Bible. You know why they want to throw the Bible away? Because they want to get God out of the picture. Her fortunes, a result of divine favor. As this nation stood upon righteousness and justice, the protection of the innocents, and a society that demanded law and order. How many knows that law is from God? He's given us the moral law. He's given us the laws of the land as guide rails to keep us from falling off the cliff. But when the nation begins to remove the guide rails called the moral laws, they would begin to remove the guide rails that were called the laws of the land and, and perversion begins to run rampant. What we're doing is we're removing God's boundaries from the earth and we're asking for Satan to come in and to do as thy will. A nation that warred against evil. A nation that sent her best and brightest overseas to fight world wars, to protect liberty, and to wage war against tyranny. This is the United States of America. A nation that understood the importance of fighting for what she believed, even unto, listen to this, even unto death. Even unto death. Over a million lives were lost in the Civil War, fighting for, listen to this, for freedom, liberty. Over 300,000 lives were fought in World War I, defending freedom, fighting against tyranny. Over a million lives lost in World War II. Since the founding of our nation, we have lost roughly 3 million men and women on battlefields. And, and that's to the best estimations. Over 3 million have died on battlefields. Do you not think that there was a war against godliness? A war that we may turn from godliness to godlessness? Then these men and women always knew what they were fighting for. They were fighting for liberty and justice for all people, all mankind. But our nation and I'm gonna tie this into the church here in a moment, has lost her way, and the body of Christ has lost her way. Just as our nation is imperfect, please stop with the, this church hurt me, this pastor hurt me. You're dealing with people that can hurt other people at times. We need to move on past that. Get your healing and move on. The church has always been imperfect, newsflash, and even the disciples were imperfect. We need not to elevate the disciples any more than we can elevate one another. Only Christ alone is perfect. Somebody shout amen. amen. So stop comparing men to anyone other than what they are, is men. Christ alone is your target. Amen. But there's been a rapid decline of morality in the church, starting with the church no longer decided to fight the good fight of faith. We put our heads in the sand. We let the world go its separate way and we continued as Brother Mike began to say in his prophetic word, we begin to hide in the four walls of this church. We did our thing and we let the world do its thing and we gave up the power and the authority and the dominion of earth that God gave to Adam. And when the church stopped fighting the good fight of the faith, she started fighting, listen to this, she started fighting with each other. Some of you fighting harder with the people in this church or with me or with someone else than you're fighting darkness. Think about this. That we're fighting over silly things in the body of Christ because you're playing into the exact thing that the enemy wants you to do which is to fight and bring strife and division amongst the brothers and sisters of Christ so we pay not attention to the real fight on the battlefield. 
quarreling, backbiting, gossiping, dividing, full of pride, full of envy, full of this and full of that, but not full, not full of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will rightfully position you to the real fight. I'm glad nobody's in the front right now. I'm spitting everywhere. I saw it go. Friends, get your house in order. It's time to fight the good fight of faith. I want to give you a few points in the little bit of time I always have. We're just going to have to go longer. You're just going to have to get used to it. Amen. Somebody shout, my voice. my voice. Somebody shout, somebody shout, our voice. Our voice. Your voice is the greatest power that God has given you. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how good looking you are. I don't care how much money you have. Your voice is the most powerful weapon that God has given you. And the ecclesia must find our voice again. I want you to put up on the screen 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. It's our main key passage this morning. I want us to read it together on the screen. Here we go. Fight the good fight of the faith. Hold up. It's of the faith. Continue. Take hold of of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We're gonna come back to that scripture and give it a little bit more context here in just a moment. But somebody shout again, our voice. We as a body, we as a church, we as Harvest Revival Center, we as a nation, we as a people must find our voice again. We must find our voice the early church was poor, pitiful, and starving, but you know what they were full of? They were rich with power and fearless unto death because they realized that their voice and therefore their voice would continue their actions and their actions would testify to their faith. But the end time church is rich, acquired great wealth and believes to be in need of nothing. And let me tell you what Christ said in Revelation chapter three, verse 14, if we could go there. Revelation chapter three, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. Next verse. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Next verse. Okay. I think I got it here. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize, that, listen, that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The end time Laodicean worldly fleshly church is pitiful, poor, wretched, blind, and naked. They say, yeah, I'm in need of nothing, but God said, let me show you the real condition of your heart. Because when we begin to go after the things of the flesh, the Lord looks upon you and say, oh, you might have acquired great wealth, but you're, you're wretched, poor, pitiful, blind, and naked. Unless you get hot or cold, I'm gonna spew you out of my mouth. Get your house in order. Am I coming across too hard today, Ben? <laughs> he said, you've been too soft too long. I'm offended. We lost focus of the fight and we lost our children. We lost our families. We lost our marriages, we lost our schools, we lost our cities, we lost our government. What else are you willing to lose before you fight the good fight of faith? It's time to fight. The church began entertaining, seducing, using the flesh to serve the emotions and the intellect, using all of its entertainment purposes to try to put people in seats and they lost the power of the spirit. Ichabod, the spirit departed. If we don't have his spirit, what do we have? What are we, some, sort, some type of club? Try to get people to come in? I'll take 12. That's what Jesus had. Pastors trying to be jealous of all the other churches that have created empires. I want 12 faithful disciples that we can change the world. 
I want a mighty church, not a mega church. I want to see the power and the glory. I want to see the transformation. I want to see God's spirit move. I want to see families saved. I want to see the world set on fire. I want to get our house in order. Come into our church, we won't offend. Come to our church, we'll motivate you and tickle your ears, tell you something you want to hear, tell you how great you are. Well, I'll tell you what the word of God says, the heart is wickedly deceitful, who would know it? The condition of our heart is we're helpless, poor, pitiful, wretched, blind, and naked. The condition of our heart is we desperately need the Spirit of God. The condition of our heart is we need Him more than we did yesterday. The condition of our heart is we need a revival to birth us because the flesh does not want to please God. And there's a dividing right now. COVID preparation. They're about ready to release the enchilada, the full, the full big bang that's coming. You better get ready, church, because there's persecution coming to the body of Christ. Get your house in order. We need to talk about sin. We need to make sure that we're at least challenging one another to continue to fight the good fight of faith. It's not easy. Whoever told you would be easy is lying to you. The faith walk is a journey that cannot be commenced without the Lord Jesus Christ. I always have to decide which parts I'm cutting away when I have basically 15 minutes left. How many's ready to pick a side? It's not time to be neutral. It's not time to ride the fence. It's not time to be passive. It's not time to just suck your thumb. It's not time to just try not to rock the boat. It's not time to just hide out. It's not time to just get lost in the, the masses. It's not time to just look confused. It's not time to just try to blend in. It's time to be polarized. It's time to be peculiar. It's time to be radical. It's time to know that you will be persecuted. It's time to know that your house is the greatest place first of your ministry. It's time to know that you need not to be ashamed. It's time to know that you can be bold and radical. It's time to know people are gonna say things about you and you're gonna have to get used to it. It's time to know that there's a great persecution that's coming in the last of days, but this is the greatest opportunity where the fields are ripe for harvest. It's time to go out and to know that it's gonna be an opportunity to win souls like never before because people are hungry, desperate, and blind. And how will they know about the gospel unless you first tell them? Yeah. Harvest Revival Center is picking a side. We're with the Lord. Amen. We're with the Lord. We pick the side of Jesus. And we bow our knee to King Jesus and no one else. We line up with the side that best represents the Father and the Son and His Spirit. And we line up with whatever political party best lines up with those values. And we will not be ashamed and we will not be quiet. Whether it be that evil is affecting our immorality, whether it be the stolen elections, whether it be apostasy, whether it be transgender demonic agenda, the homosexual agenda, abortion, sex trafficking, equality act, sexualization of our children, antichrist, new world order, and godless society, it's time we pick sides. We have to pick a side. It's life or death. It's good versus evil. I'm here to declare that we We'll always pick the side of Jesus and we will fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen? So what fight is God calling you to? Pastor Randy told you about some opportunities and things that are going on. I was looking for Mike. I don't see him. Is he back there somewhere? There he is. Brother Mike gave his word about it's time to get out of these walls of the church. What is your fight? What, what is your passion? What stirs your heart? No thing is too insignificant. What about you? What are you called to do? What are you called to take up? What are you called to be a light into your community? Very quickly, I see there's three dimensions that God's calling us to fight. Number one, and that's the fight in the spirit. Paul instructed Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. 
And why would you need to fight the good fight of faith? Because faith, listen to me, faith is a spiritual battle every day. It's, it's spiritual. Faith is seeing what you can, faith is believing what you cannot see. Faith is believing God at his word. Faith is believing that God is your provider. Faith is believing that everything is gonna be fine in Christ Jesus. Faith is believing in your eternity. Faith is believing in your destiny. Faith is believing that Christ is above all and is all and he is everything. Faith is a spiritual battle. Every day the enemy is looking to steal your faith. And why would you need to fight the good fight of faith? Because if you look around, it's sometimes easy to feel that you're outnumbered. Yes? If you look around, it sometimes feel like it's impossible. If you look around, it sometimes feels intimidating. If you look around, it sometimes feels, be honest, it sometimes feels hopeless even down to your finances. Any family members trying to buy groceries and feel like you're being squeezed at every side? The good fight of faith looks beyond that. First Timothy 6, 12, as I said earlier, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. To understand 12, I wanna give us proper context that Paul was writing to his spiritual son, Timothy. And in verse five, let me read through verse 12, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I don't have time, as much time to break this apart. Verse seven, for we brought nothing into this world, say I brought nothing, and we cannot take anything out of the world. You know, you cannot take this. I said this the other day. I've never seen a hearse haul in a U-Haul, except for one time, I really did. It was, it happened, it was interesting. Verse nine, but those who desire, listen to this, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. When you walk into passion, the riches follow you. When you, when you walk and strive towards riches, what only thing that comes after you is the impen, impending danger of temptation. Because how many knows if you chase riches, it, it's a black hole, you can never have enough. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires, listen to this, that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money, not money, the love of money. Money is an excellent slave and a terrible master. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. What happened is when the church becomes beloved about money, it's a sacrifice of the spirit. When the church or the compromised church, I'm not saying who it is, but in this latter day Laodicean age, when the church made things about prosperity only, what happens is there's compromise, and in that there is impending destruction. Because the Laodicean church had everything. They said, we're in need of nothing. How many knows the Lord had something else to say about that? Now in verse 11, but as for you, man of God, Timothy, flee these things. Listen to your assignment. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We see right now that there is, a, there is going to be a time that the church may have none of what the church values today. And what I mean by that is, look around. You've got lights, cameras, action. I just thought that was the right time to say that. We got lights, we got cameras, we got seats, we've got climate control, we've got a gym, we got all this stu stuff. What does your faith look like if this is gone? What does this faith look like if there's nowhere to meet? The church has seen many times of persecution. 
Maybe it'd be a disaster. I don't know. But where is your faith? Are you ready to start a home church? Right now, who's ready to start a home church? Are you ready to win your block? Because what's stopping you doing it right now? Does your neighbor know that you walk with the Lord? Paul instructs Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. We won't always have this comfort. I mean, I would love to tell you, you would. I, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? The first fight that we must wage is from within. Say within. When we fight the fight from within, what happens is we manifest what we have been fighting and getting the victory over. This is found in verse 11, to pursue, pursue righteousness. You could fight for anything righteous and God considers that to be a noble fight. Did you know that? When you fight for righteousness, you're fighting for God. You put your efforts towards that, God honors that. Maybe there's, a, there's something in your heart that you feel there's an injustice and you fight for that. God considers that to be a good fight of faith. To pursue godliness. When you and your family, you have made a pursuit to pursue God, God considers that a fight and a good fight of faith. How many knows that the enemy doesn't want you following after God? Number three, when you pursue faith. When you pursue faith and you're after faith and you're after expanding your faith and you're after believing God, then God considers that to be righteous. He considers that to be fighting the good fight of faith. Listen to this. When you pursue love, you know love is the greatest weapon that's in your arsenal every single time. You ever try to whip up on love? You ever have, you ever been in a fight and that other person was really loving? Anybody? How long did the fight last? <laughs> was that Eric that said that? Eric goes like two seconds. <laughs> I'm being honest though. You've ever really in a spouse, in two spouses, have you ever been really upset with your spouse and then one person in the marriage just really got real loving? <laughs> Who said something? Who, what happened? It was back there? Well, when you pursue love, you know love covers a multitude of sin. You know love wins. You know what love really is? It's when you become selfless. Because every time you're protecting self, you fight. You fight hard. But when you put self out of the way, love comes into the room. God considers that a good find of faith. Amen? Amen? When you pursue steadfastness, resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering, God considers anything that you're fighting the fight of faith with steadfastness, you're committed. God considers that to be noble and true. And when you're even pursuing gentleness, that is best understood. Listen, that's best understood as being humble. That word is interchangeable. I believe humility is a better translation. And it is translated that in some versions. Fighting any of these fronts, you begin to see purpose. Listen to me. When you fight these fronts, you begin to see purpose manifest in your life. It's bigger than you. Anything you fight that is the good fight of faith is bigger than you. This is why people often in things and occupations like military and they get out of the military, they were in something great big and then they got out and they lost themselves. Or they were part of a sports program or they were part of a, a, an enterprise or they were part of a corporation and all of a sudden they're not part of that because the body of Christ needs to understand that when we get unified on the front, we realize our common enemy is darkness. We get unified and we become bigger than any one of us. I just talked about the unity in the body of Christ last week. Because we need to take on this fight against evil. It's a spiritual battle and we have a spiritual adversary. Ephesians 6, 12 says, we do not wrestle. That word wrestle is also translated as fight. 
against flesh and blood. You ever been in a wrestling match? If you watch most, most fights, at some point, that fight is taken down. It may have started here. It's taken down to a wrestling match, poking each other's eyeballs out. You ever feel like you're trying to poke Satan's eyeballs out? Man, I fought hard at times with the devil. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers, I am wrapping up over, the pre, over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Church, we have a battle right now and the battle is fierce and it's bigger than your personal struggle. Please hear me, it's bigger than your personal struggle. What's happening with America right now is a result of people being too consumed with their personal struggle and we lost the real fight and we lost vision of the battlefield because the enemy took us to our own battlefield and all we were ever consumed with is self. Number two, the fight for our own soul. This is the, the hour waging war against our souls right now. This hour, more than ever, it's the fight against the, our own souls. Keeping our soul man in check and not being swept away by its passions. Not say, I'm not giving up. You're not giving up in this faith walk. If you see somebody about ready to give up, church, you better get in and intervene. Because right now there's people leaving the faith walk all the time because they didn't have battle buddies that were looking out for them. This walk gets hard sometimes, right? Yeah. So you ever had a hard time? Somebody needs you right now, a phone call, a Bible verse. Somebody needs maybe to be taken out to lunch, taken out to breakfast, encouraged. Well, pastor's not preaching. What, I'll tell you what, right now, you think that I'm the only equation in all of this? Wrong answer. If you see somebody hurting in the body, you, you're part of God's hands and feet too. Go and encourage them. Lift them up. Pray for them. Let them know you're there. We should not be surprised by the different types of things that are happening amongst us. I care for you. Do you care for your brother or sister sitting to your left or right? Every single person in this church should have some type of dialogue with somebody in this church every single week. Every single week. By the way, I just want to thank you for coming today. Miss El Elridge? Evage. Evage, I'm so sorry. Evage, right? Mrs. Evage. What's your first name? Amy. Amy. Can we give them a hand and their beautiful daughters? Thank you for coming today. But guys, this is a good fight of faith. And when you're strong, someone else is probably weak in that moment. They need some of your strength. That's what taking up the gap is. When someone's weak, your stance right now and your strength needs to widen to cover what used to be two men is now one. You're gonna stand in the gap right now while they get mended up and come off the playing field for a little bit. This, this war is fierce. It's no more time for little pansy church. Not gonna happen on this watch. Amen? Amen? Luke chapter 13, verse 22. I'm gonna read quickly. I wanna be done in five minutes. Lord, forgive me. Josh, don't encourage me. <laughs> he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? What a question. And I think the disciples were kind of thinking like, look, we're walking with Jesus. All these other, all y'all, you all you're all going to hell. Oh, don't trust me. The flesh is wicked. You start getting close to the Lord, now you just think you're better than everyone else. That's how wicked the flesh is. But the Lord did say this. He said to them, verse 24, now look at this, strive, somebody shout strive. strive. If you translate this, one of the translations is fight. He says fight to enter the narrow door. Say, it's narrow. narrow. It's so narrow, your flesh, your mind, your will, your emotions outside of its subjection to the spirit cannot fit through that door. It's a little door. He says, enter through the narrow door for many, shout many. I will tell you, will seek to enter, and guess what? 
They will not be able to. Last week, I talked about the fear of the Lord. That verse right, right there better bring some healthy fear of the Lord to you. Well, that's not fair. Take that up with the Lord. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you will begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. What is this right here? What is this? This house, people say, I don't have to go to a church. I've got the church is the body of Christ. This is just the assembly. This is the house of the people. This is the house of God for the people. This is a place that's wholly consecrated unto the Lord. This house intentionally is a house that when we come in here, there should be a level of expectation that God's gonna move every single week. This is a prayer closet for a bunch of us. Do you go to your prayer closet and think that God's not gonna listen? When we come here, there should be this wild expectation of what is God gonna do? Is he gonna heal someone? Is he gonna save someone? Is he gonna send somebody? Is he gonna light a fire in somebody? Is he gonna touch somebody? Is, he gonna, is there gonna be someone that rededicates their life to the Lord today? Is there somebody that's gonna be filled up with the spirit of God today? This, there should be expectation that people are gonna begin to come to get charged up in the spirit so they can get back in the fight. This is a revival center. Say it. This is a revival center. Say it again. This is a revival center. In this house, we're going to set people free. In this house, we're going to worship. In this house, we're going to pray. In this house, we're going to train. In this house, we're going to heal by the power of Jesus. In this house, we're going to deliver in the name of Jesus Christ. In this house, we're going to kick out devils. In this house, we're going to put Satan under our feet. In this house, we're going to give people a new mind of Christ. In this house, we're going to train up the army of God. In this house. I'm sick of doing church. I'm just done with it. I'm so sick of it. I want to see revival. I left a career to see revival. I'm not looking back. I'm charging ahead. You're either with Christ or you're against him. It's time for revival. I'm sorry. It's true. I want revival. It's the only thing that's going to save this nation is revival. Of course, I got locked out of the computer. That's okay. So Jesus goes on to say, but I say, I, say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from because here's the deal. He, he says, I don't know you. Isn't that terrifying when you could have been in the house of the Lord for 20, 30, 40 years and all of a sudden he says, I don't know who you are. You know what that really means? That means that you had a formally form of godliness, but you denied the power thereof. You never, you just were just an actor. You were an imposter. You were an impersonator. You played the part. You were double-minded. You were double-faced. You had a mask on. You didn't know him. You knew about him, but you never knew him. You knew how to, Talk to talk, but you never walk to walk. Are you getting the picture? If that doesn't bring the fear of the Lord, I'm sorry, that's the text. That's your Lord Jesus Christ said there will be, there will be few. There will be, the door will be narrow. There's a part, I love you. I've given you my spirit. I know your flesh is wicked. I've got a remedy for that. But there's something that you have to submit to the Lord to say, Lord, I don't want a part of this world. And you say, well, I don't know because the very thing that I want to do, I don't do. And the very thing that I do do, do do, I don't do. Which is do do. It's do do. And the very fact that you're struggling with that is the very thing that probably says that you're in him. Because when you're not concerned about your sin, you're not of him. When you wrestle and you hate the stench 
of the sin that you can't overcome and you toil and you fight. That is that dead stench of self that's tied to your body that says you're not going to get the victory because the Spirit of God is greater than he who's in this world. There's a fight, a good fight of faith that we must contend with in this hour and your flesh is no match for the Spirit. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me. And this is what he says, you workers of evil. You weren't after my father's house. You weren't after the kingdom. You were after yourself. You were after stirring up division in the body. You were after backbiting. You were after gossiping. You were after envy and strife. You weren't doing anything for my kingdom. You were against me. But Lord, we drank with you. You were against me. Get your house in order. And people will come from the east and west, from the north and south, and they'll recline in the table of the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. I don't know which position I'm in, but I just want to get there. Amen? Amen. Saints of God, you're in a war. The church is in a war. Your soul has always been in a war. Well, how long? Well, until the Lord brings you home. Temptation, struggles, battles. Don't think just because you go to church or you went to church or you raised your hand in church or you grew up in church that somehow that you're entering that narrow door. Not now. This is not the time to play games with God. This is no, there's no time for that. Pick a side. It's time to pick a side. I know this, full of imperfections of this house, this church has already decided we're going with the side of Christ Jesus. And that door, as it goes in, it's going to get more narrow and more narrow. And there will be a time of squeezing and everyone who can't fit will be pushed out. And I don't mean that that's some sort of club. I mean that we're being called to be a righteous, holy church that's not here to condemn the rest of the body, but we're here to pursue a holy, godly lifestyle. Because when that happens, God's going to pour out his spirit. And I want to send messengers into the highways and the byways. I want us to go out and to see a generation that's changed by Jesus Christ. The results of victory within the spirit and victory within the soul is a natural compelling to achieve victory from without. And the natural man begins to permeate that very thing that God put inside of us. Matthew 28, 18, I want to close here. Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, shout go therefore. Listen to this. Listen to this. Here's our assignment. And make disciples of all nations. If we're to go, that means that this place has, has, is no indicator of whether we're making disciples. You could pack a bunch of people in here. I guarantee you this. If we got so-and-so or so-and-so, we had this band or this band, we could put people in the seats. Put your favorite speaker up here. We put people in the seats. Have carnivals, have light shows. We'll put people in the seats. It's not hard to put people in the seats, but it's hard to make disciples. Who are you discipling? You waiting for me to do it? I feel like I'm being too real today, Ben. You waiting for me to make disciple? What about you? Are you making a disciple? Just one. Who are you discipling right now? Who are you discipling? Do you have someone in your life that you're mentoring, discipling, encouraging, sharing the word with? A grandson, a nephew, a friend, a coworker? We are called to make disciples, to share the gospel, to train, equip. You know your faith is contagious. Faith is the most contagious substance in the world. Second to close is discouragement. Second to close is complaining. But you know, you put a faith-filled person in the room, it changes the entire room. 14 people says we can't. One person says, yes, we can. We can't do it. Yes, we can. 
You know, just those words, yes, we can. You take 15 people that said no. You said, yes, we can. And all of a sudden, a measure of faith just got deposited in every person's heart. Really? Yes, you can. Look at your neighbor say, yes, you can. Look at your other neighbor say, you can do it. Look at your other neighbor, if you have another neighbor. Say, you'll get through this. Saints of God, we're in the greatest battle the world's ever seen here in this nation, here around the world. Satan is preparing for the last of days. These are the greatest moments in time that your faith can be so radical that we begin to see revival that your grandparents prayed for and your great-great-grandparents prayed for and your great-great-great-grandparents prayed for that you're here in it now. The timing wasn't right. The time's right now. Faith is rising right now inside of your heart knowing that you can be a part of God's chosen vessels here on this earth that can get through that narrow door that will one day sup with him, that one day he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Is there anything better than hearing those words? Chrissy, will you come on up? 1249. When you have, listen to me, when you have nothing worth fighting for, do you realize that you have nothing worth living for? The very instrument that God uses to fight, and that, by the way, that's, that's not fighting with your spouse, okay? And that's not the fight we're talking about. It's a good fight of faith. God has put it in you, men, be men. Look, look, men, please listen to me. It's time to set the example, to be the priest of your home, not to rule with some type of tyrant fist. No, it's to rule with love. It's to rule with your prayer closet. It's to rule with your faith. It's to rule with, with the passion of Christ that's in you. I know this, the Lord put it in my heart five years ago that we we're gonna be a revival generation church. I'd be lying if I had had moments of wanting to give up. But you know what was along the way, Ben? Certain individuals at time that stood in the gap to encourage me say, don't. Ben just showed me this graphic that says the world needs who you were made to be. God made you with purpose. And I'll tell you the greatest purpose right now is the spirit of God comes alive in you greatest purpose right now is that a generation does not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right now there's a world around you that just one moment of intentionality that you can reach is not hard. I want to share something just for God's glory on this. I just want to show you how simple this is. Remember I often talk about when you go to restaurants, it's the easiest place to witness, right? You literally have someone that comes up to you. This is about two weeks ago. We were actually up towards you, up in Xenia. No, it was actually, we just left your house that night. We stopped somewhere in Xenia. I could tell this lady was having a little bit of a rough time. Just being friendly with her. Katie and I were there. I said some things, right? Kind of spoke into her life. And it was just Katie and I, the bill was like 30 some dollars. So the Lord laid on my heart to tip her $30, which how many knows $30 or $30, but sometimes if he tells you to tip, do it. If he doubles the bill, do it. But then I put a little note that Jesus loves her, said a couple of other things. She messaged me, she found me. This may be odd, however, I just felt as if I needed to say something. I was your server at tonight. I cannot thank you enough, Roosters. I cannot thank you enough for your kindness. I've been going through one of the hardest times of my life recently, and my day today was absolutely terrible. I want you to know just how far, how far a kind gesture could go. I've had some of the darkest thoughts in my whole entire life this last week. I seriously cannot lie when I say you saved me tonight. 
I really... <laughs> I really do thank you. You are a blessing. $30 and some kindness and some Christ-likeness save somebody. What to save them from? I don't know, that's between her and God. Would you spend $30 today to get that? Every day there's an opportunity and it doesn't always require money. And in fact, I'll tell you, it's least required of money, but sometimes God will challenge you there too. You know what? It all belongs to him. It's all his. Your money, it's his. And if you don't think that, then that money has a stronghold over you. I guarantee you that right now. The reason God sets up tithes and offering is it's the only check in your life to make sure that that money doesn't become a ruler over you. If you can't give 10%, what happens when he tells you to give it all? You ain't giving it. What happens if, he, if you can't give all your money to God, if he called you to do it, you're not gonna, if he calls you to do something radical, that's indicative on your faith, even with your money. It's a stronghold, it's his. I don't care where it goes. You don't think he could get more of it? I mean, honestly, can God not get more money? He wants you, that's the point. He wants you, he wants all of you. Would you stand with me? I don't know where your heart is this morning, but I want to tell you right now that you need to stop the, the wrong fight. You need to stop the wrong fight. Father, I just thank you right now. Raise your hands up to the Lord if you could. Father, I thank you, Lord, for those who have been engaged in the wrong fight, the wrong fight. I pray that you bring your healing, your deliverance. Pray you bring your kindness. I pray that you would bring hope. Right now, hope is being released in this room. Hope. Hope in the freedom that that loving kindness that God has gifted with you, that you put down the swords. Put down the swords with your friends, with your spouse, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and that you would begin to take up the sword of the Spirit in the right place against your adversary. I pray, Father, right now that you bring a burning passion and fire into the belly of our soul, that we would begin to know that a remnant is rising, that passion is rising, that time is running out. I pray that you would begin to bring a holy level of righteousness and purity and burn up our iniquity. I pray you'd unify this body, that we would rightfully come into the destiny of this house, that this house shall be known as a place of revival, as a place of healing, as a place of deliverance. And Father, I pray right now that you begin to teach us how to fight the good fight of faith how to prepare for the great harvest of the end of the age. I pray, Lord, you would mend bodies, souls, hearts, minds. I pray every disease that has afflicted the body would begin to be melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. I pray, Father, for a reinvigoration of passion and desire to serve the Lord. And we declare that we will fight the good fight of faith in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said, God bless you. God bless you. Let's give a shout to the Lord.